Ok. Buenas tardes. Vamos a seguir eh, con la conferencia de la profesora Sara Cowi. A ver, menos disrupciones en el aula. <risa> que gente está un poco despistada. Bueno, perdonad. Voy a hacer una pequeña presentación de la doctora Sara Cowi. Eh, para aquellos que no la conocéis y para que, aquellos que la conocéis, pues también, claro. Entonces, Sara Cowie es profesora en la Universidad de Auckland, en New Zealand, en el Departamento de Psicología, y ella, pues realmente, a toda su vida eh, de estudiante y profesional es, eh, se ha desarrollado en esta universidad. Fue estudiante de Psicología en la Universidad de Auckland, hizo el, el posgrado y el, el doctorado en la Universidad de Auckland, y ahora es profesora, primero investigadora y profesora en esta universidad. Eh, trabaja en la unidad de análisis experimental del comportamiento, utilizando principalmente palomas como sujetos experimentales. Su director de tesis fue un profesor muy conocido, el doctor Michael Davison, y también colabora con el profesor Douglas E. Life. Entonces, eh, como, como algunas pequeñas notas que os quiero comentar, bueno, ella es profesora en el departamento, en la actualidad, por lo que he visto, está impartiendo docencia fundamentalmente en las materias relacionadas con aprendizaje y conducta, pero me ha llamado la atención que da una asignatura que se llama Mente, Cerebro y Conducta. Entonces, esto ya es que el conductismo se expande, ¿no? Podemos decir, o sea, como que ya no hay límites al conductismo. Es un enfoque conductista, como veréis, el de Sara Cowie, muy de la línea molarista, y por lo tanto un poco extendida en, eh, en, y un poco más flexible en la utilización de estos términos, más bien que hace poco pues, se podían caracterizar de puramente mentalistas. Eh, investiga básicamente sobre cómo nuestras decisiones y acciones están controladas por los eventos del pasado, cómo los estímulos en, eh, y lo que nosotros llamamos los reforzadores en realidad eh, producen respuestas, y cómo estas producción de respuestas por estímulos antecedentes se extienden en el tiempo para predecir lo que va a venir después. Entonces, un poco este juego entre qué controla la conducta, si el pasado o el futuro, es eh, el objetivo también, de, yo creo, de su presentación de hoy y de sus líneas de investigación fundamental, con investigación, ya os digo, de laboratorio básico, aunque también últimamente ha tenido algunas publicaciones y algunas colaboraciones utilizando sujetos humanos como participantes tanto de estudiantes de psicología, que como sabéis son los, los participantes típicos, de, igual que las palomas y las ratas, los son en los laboratorios animales, eh, también con, con una dimensión de intentar eh, eh, explicar conducta maladaptativa, exagerada, compulsiva, desadaptativa, a través de estos modelos que ella os va a contar. Y finalmente deciros que aunque... Sara Howie, como, como su propia apariencia dice, su propio currículum, pues le, leyó la tesis en 2014, es una persona recientemente doctorada, sin embargo, su producción científica es enorme. O sea, es una persona que tiene en poco tiempo una producción científica muy grande y muy importante. Eh, ha publicado en, eh, en, en las más prestigiosas revistas de nuestro campo, por mencionar algunas, pues en el JEAP, en el Learning and Behaviors, Journal of Experimental Psychology, Behavioral Processes, pues son las revistas más afines a nuestros campos de investigación. Entonces, como creo que de acuerdo a este enfoque que representa Sara Cowie, que yo creo que os va a transmitir hoy, no está claro que exista el reforzador, este efecto de publicación que he notado es muy de festón, pero claro, como no hay reforzador, no se sabe cuándo va a parar, ¿no? Entonces, en cualquier caso, os dejo con Sara Cowie un placer. Es un placer tenerla aquí y darle un aplauso fuerte. Gracias, Ricardo, y gracias por invitarme. No hablo español, as you can tell, so I'm going to do this in English, but some of my slides have some Spanish on it, and thank you to the people who have checked some of those slides and my apologies for the ones that I added and didn't get a chance to get a native Spanish speaker to check. I want to talk to you today about something that builds on 
many of the themes that we've been hearing throughout this conference. Billy Baum talked yesterday about an approach where he likened control of behavior to the flow of a river. So rather than there being reinforcement that strengthens behavior and pushes it into the future, that there was a sort of a, a pull and a flow of induction. And this is a similar sort of perspective. And what I want to talk to you about is the past and how the past influences our behavior. And there's no denying that the past, our past experience is critical in determining present behavior. But it seems that the past doesn't mechanistically push us into the present, push our behavior forward, that the past is important because it helps us to detect the structure of the environment. And it's that environmental structure that controls our behavior. So as Gabby talked about in the last symposium, behavior is organized in time and also in space according to the structure, the temporal, the physical, the spatial structure of the environment. The only way that we have of learning about that structure is through experience, and that is through regular, repeated exposure to environmental regularities. And these might be ordinal. I know that Saturday always follows Friday because for my entire life, every time I've experienced a Friday, there's been a Saturday right after it. I know that if I go into my kitchen at six o'clock in the morning, then there will be coffee there because in my relatively long-term learning history, every time I've gone into my kitchen at six in the morning, my husband has been there with a freshly brewed cup of coffee for me. I know that if I leave my office, I have to walk about 16 paces down the corridor in order to get to the elevator. So temporal, spatial, even sequential order in the environment and repeated exposure to this order in the environment allows our behavior to come under control of that order, that is the structure of the environment. And the control here is not so much by what we've experienced in the past, but by what the structure allows us to detect about what is likely to happen next. That is where valuable resources, phylogenetically important events are likely to be in the future. So it's the structure of the environment that we learn that controls our behavior that allows us to respond in accordance with what is likely to occur next, rather than simply repeating the past as it has always occurred. So I'll talk about reinforcers, but I'm talking about reinforcers here as just using them as a noun, rather than saying phylogenetically important events, because I have a long learning history of using the word reinforcers, and all of you know what I mean by reinforcers, that is something good that's added to the environment. What I'm not using the term reinforces to convey is any sort of process. So this, much like the approach that Billy Baum talked about, is an approach where reinforces do not strengthen behavior or connections or anything. That reinforces are really just important stimuli, but they have no special function. And the control here is by what is predicted or discriminated to occur next as extrapolated from past experience, from repeated exposure to regularities in the environment. To demonstrate control by future, we need to, set to arrange a situation where we can separate out past control from future control. And that is a situation where the future, the immediate future, differs from what happened in the past. So here's a really nice, simple demonstration, an experiment that we did with three and four-year-old children. This was a game, it was a treasure hunt game. They had two cups that they could lift up. And under one of those two cups, there was a reinforcer. And under the other cup, there was no reinforcer. And there was a pattern across trials. So one reinforcer per trial. In the next trial, the reinforcer was always located under the cup that didn't contain the reinforcer in the previous trial. So the future then, is different from the past. Where my next reinforcer is going to come from is a different location, a different behavior to what produced my reinforcer in the immediate past. And these trials went on and on in that sequence. So each reinforcer signals that the next reinforcer is available for the other response. And what we did was we calculated the probability of choosing the same alternative. 
If there's control by the past in that reinforcement strengthening sense, then we should see a high probability of repeating the behavior that was just reinforced, lifting up the same cup, so something close to 1.0. Instead, what we see, this is averaged across the children in the experiment because their behavior was all very similar, the probability of choosing the same response, repeating the just reinforced response, is about 0.2. So they are much more likely to choose the other cup than they are to choose the response that was most recently reinforced. So controlled by what is likely to happen next, as discriminated from that repeated regular exposure to those environmental regularities, that consistent sequence. And just to make those of you who work with animals, as I mostly do, comfortable, it's not that the children were different, special, strange. If we do the same experiment with pigeons, which we did, the pigeons are picking keys rather than lifting up cups, the pigeons also choose in accordance with which response is likely to produce the next reinforcer, not which one produced the last reinforcer. So control is in the future, provided that a future can be extrapolated from the recent past. But one thing that you'll notice here is that the probability of getting your next reinforcer for the same response was zero. There was never, ever an opportunity to get the reinforcer, the next reinforcer for the same response. And yet, both our pigeons and our children are choosing the next, the, the, the not just reinforced response with a probability of 0.2. Uh, with, sorry, choosing the just reinforced response with a probability of 0.2. So although they are more likely to choose the other response, they are not choosing in exact accordance with the probability of what the next where the next reinforcer is going to be. So there's some degree of control by that environmental structure, but the control is not perfect. And the question is, why is it that the environment is not perfectly controlling behavior? And one thing that may very well be a possibility is that control is by the structure of the environment but the, dis but the structure that is detected by the organism. That is, important events, reinforcers, take place in time, they take place in location, they take place across many stimulus dimensions. Some of those stimulus dimensions, like for our children and our pigeons, the location, the response that produced that reinforcer, those dimensions are important in detecting the structure of the environment. If you make an error in detecting which response produced the reinforcer, that is, you generalize from left to right, same to other, whatever the response dimension is, then you will not be able to, de to detect the structure of the environment as it occurs. So the greater the extent of generalization across a dimension of a reinforcer, the weaker the control is going to be by the environment because that generalization weakens the detection of the structure of the environment. So accurate detection of the structure of the environment requires that every relevant dimension of a reinforcer is detected accurately every single time a reinforcer occurs. If there's any generalization at all across some dimension of a reinforcer, then the structure of the environment as detected by the organism is going to differ from the structure of the environment as it actually stands. And we know that control is by what is discriminated rather than what is actually arranged. So generalization across any event is important in determining the degree to which the environment controls behavior. Generalization will determine the extent to which the structure of the environment as discriminated by the organism differs from the structure of the environment as it actually is. The more different, the weaker the control by the environment will, will appear because the organism's behavior is tracking the structure of the environment as the organism detects that structure. In that last, re in that last experiment that I showed you, the reinforcers, the relevant dimension of those reinforcers was their occurrence in location, the response that produced them. But typically the environment is much more complex than that. If you have a reinforcer, that reinforcer occurs at a location, but it may also occur in other dimensions as well. So it occurs, for example, at a time. Both the time, the location of the reinforcer are likely to be important in detecting the structure of the environment, those regularities that allow us to 
adapt our behavior according to what is likely to happen next. So here's an experiment that demonstrates that we still get, that demonstrates that we do get this weak or imperfect control by environments that are highly structured. In this particular experiment, we're working with pigeons, and the pigeons have two keys that they can pick. The session is divided up into a series of trials, and at the beginning of each trial, one key has a high probability of producing a reinforcer, the other key has a low probability of producing a reinforcer. The reinforcers are always arranged on a VI schedule, so you never know exactly when you're going to get a reinforcer. But if you are early on in a trial, you know which key has the higher probability of producing a reinforcer, which one has the lower probability. So we get something like this if we look back over the reinforcers that have been obtained over the last 40 sessions. We get lots of reinforcers on the higher probability key and few reinforcers on the lower probability key in the first 20 seconds of that trial. Once 20 seconds has gone by since the beginning of the trial, the location of the higher and lower probability key reverses. So now we're getting more reinforcers on the key that at these later times, we're getting more reinforcers on the key that used to have a low probability. It's now the higher probability key. And the key that at the beginning of the trial was the, was the higher probability key now has the lower probability of producing a reinforcer. So there's a very systematic way in which the environment is changing. The, likely, the response more likely to produce a reinforcer changes systematically across time, and if we aggregate the reinforcers across an extended period of exposure, this should allow us to determine the structure of the environment, because it's these reinforcers, these important events that form the structure of the environment and their occurrence in time and space, and therefore it should allow us to determine the behavior of the organism. So if we were to take the ratio of left to right reinforcers, reinforcers obtained from our two keys, at each time within a trial, using the reinforcers aggregated across the experience of the pigeon over the last 40 sessions, say, this would give us a function like this. And what this tells us is that in the first 20 seconds of a trial, you're more likely to get a reinforcer on the left if you've gone for more than 20 seconds in a trial, you are now more likely to get a reinforcer in the right. This is the actual structure of the environment. But of course, in timing procedures, we never get perfect control by the passage of time. And the behavior that we get tracks that change in the availability of reinforcers. That's in the yellow. But you can see that it's missing those reinforcers slightly. That is, although the behavior choice between the two alternatives is changing across time, choice is changing gradually, whereas the reinforcer availability is reversing abruptly. So choice is also less extreme than the reinforcer differential. So there's some degree of control by that structure of that environment, but it's not perfect control. And I'm going to show you that we can explain why this control is imperfect by incorporating generalization processes into this structure of the environment. That is, by generalizing reinforcers across time and generalizing them across the location of the response that produced them. So if we take the reinforcers that were obtained in the pigeon's recent learning history at each time within a trial, the first generalization process that we might apply is generalizing those reinforcers across location, that is, across the location of the response that produced them. Because remember, the response that produced the reinforcer is very important in discriminating the structure of the environment. To do this, we're going to take a proportion of the reinforcers that are obtained at each location at each time, and we're going to misallocate them to the other alternative. We're generalizing them from left to right and right to left. And when, once we do this, we're doing this for reinforcers in every time bin, this gives us a, the discriminated number of reinforcers after generalization across location. And if we were to take the log ratio of this, that would show us a discriminated structure of the environment that is closer to what the pigeon is actually doing, but still not quite there. And that's because we haven't incorporated that other important dimension of the reinforcer, that is, the time at which it occurs. So if we take those reinforcers after generalization across location, and we then generalize them across time, 
that should get us closer to the structure of the environment as detected by the organism. So we're going to take the reinforcers in each time bin at each location, and we're going to redistribute them across surrounding times to model that generalization across time. We're going to do this according to a normal distribution, which means that reinforcers have an impact on the detected structure of the environment. The biggest impact that they have is at the time at which they actually occur. But they're also having an impact on the detected structure at earlier times as well as at later times. Why a normal distribution? Simply because a normal distribution works. We've played around with other distributions, but nothing does quite as good a job as the normal distribution presently. So let's redistribute those reinforcers across surrounding times. The standard deviation of these distributions is going to increase as those times get longer. This allows us to capture the scalar property of timing, the fact that estimates of time become increasingly less accurate as the duration to be estimated gets longer. So we'll redistribute those reinforcers across time. We'll take the log ratio of those reinforcers, and this gives us the or well, this should give us anyway, the structure of the environment as detected by the organism. That is, this should give us an indication of the choice that we should expect from our pigeons in this procedure. We've also added a constant to denote inherent bias, but that's a fairly minor point. So if we compare what this particular model, this generalization approach says, sorry, what this generalization approach says the organism should be doing in the green with what the organism is actually doing in the yellow, you can see that this approach allows us to predict very, very closely what the organism is doing. It's doing a really good job of describing behavior, simply applying generalization processes to the reinforcers, generalizing them across time and across space. And this is what the model looks like as an equation, but after five o'clock, that's a little bit brutal. But it turns out that the same process applies not just to that specific procedure, but to a whole bunch of other situations. That is, in this procedure that I just showed you, reinforcer time and reinforcer location are the relevant dimensions of those reinforcers. But reinforcers are multidimensional. If you change your procedure, the time may not be relevant, the location may not be the relevant stimulus, there may be other relevant stimuli. So let's see how the model does in other tasks where the stimulus dimensions, the relevant dimensions of those reinforcers are different. Here's the exact same sort of task. There's a change in the location or in the, the response that is more likely to produce a reinforcer as a function of time since the start of a trial. But this time we're defining our response alternatives by how rapidly they are flashing between red and green, rather than whether they are located on the left or the right. So here we would be generalizing across flash duration, fast flash versus low flash, as well as across the time at which the reinforcers have occurred. But there's no generalization across left and right because left and right is no longer relevant to detecting the structure of the environment. And you can see choice in the white and what the model predicts the organism should be doing in the pink. And you can see that the two are falling on top of each other. That is, the model is doing an excellent job applying these two generalization processes, allows us to describe behavior in this slightly different situation as well. Here's a situation where instead of having something change, the likely location of a reinforcer change across time since a marker event, it changes with the number of responses emitted. So now one of the relevant stimulus dimensions is number rather than time. So we're generalizing across location because it's a left-right discrimination. And we're generalizing now across the number of responses emitted since the beginning of the trial. And you can see white is the behavior, pink is what the model says the behavior should be doing after these generalization processes have been applied to the obtained reinforcers. The model is doing a fantastic job of describing behavior in that situation as well. Here's another situation where we're defining our responses according to color rather than left-right location or flash duration. This is slightly different as well because there are reinforcers, the reinforcers are only ever able to be obtained on one key, it's VI or extinction. And when we fit the model to these data, the 
choice of the pigeons is in the white, what the model says the pigeons should be choosing on the basis of those generalized reinforcers now generalized across color and across time, the model is doing a fantastic job. And it's not just a model of pigeon behavior. Here is some data from an experiment with rats. Same deal, VI schedule on one alternative, extinction on the other, rats pressing levers for food, and the lever that is more likely to produce a reinforcer changes at a particular point halfway through the trial. The behavior is in the white, what the model predicts is in the pink, and you can see that the model is again doing a fantastic job. Different species, different behavior, different task, different reinforcers, and yet it's allowing us to understand what is going on. So what this is telling us is that every dimension of a reinforcer or an important event is subject to generalization. Even in those tasks, many of those tasks that I showed you are tasks that are used for studying timing, temporal discrimination. But even in those tasks, location is an important element of detecting the structure of the environment, behaving according to where the next reinforcer is likely to occur. And even in those tasks that we design as timing tasks, there is some very small but important degree of generalization across the location dimension of the reinforcer. So every dimension of an important event is subject to generalization. And the neat thing about it is that we're applying generalization processes that are conceptually similar, regardless of the dimension. Now you might be wondering, the generalization across location that I talked about, I talked about taking a proportion of reinforcers and misallocating them to the other location. When I talked about time, I talked about redistributing with a continuous normal distribution. That, redistrib that misallocation of a proportion of reinforcers is really just a special case of generalization. That is because of the procedures that we use, where typically we have two discreetly different locations, two discreetly different colors, two discreetly different flash durations. We could, in theory, apply the same continuous generalization process to location, to color, to flash duration, it's just that the setup that we have, the apparatus, doesn't allow us to arrange it as a continuous dimension, so we're using a special case that is that proportion. But the important thing is that the concept behind the way that these generalization processes work, these different generalization across different stimulus dimensions, the idea behind it, the mechanism, the way it works is exactly the same. And there's good evidence to suggest that there is something very similar about how we perceive time, space, number, all sorts of different stimulus dimensions. But the other cool thing about this is that this gives us a separate measure of or an estimate of where the generalization is occurring most. So we can tell if we're looking at behavior in an environment and we're seeing that there is very weak control by the environment, if we can apply a model that gives us separate estimates of generalization across the different dimensions, we have a method of telling where that generalization is occurring, that is, why the control is weak. Is it a problem discriminating time? Is it a problem discriminating number? Is it a problem discriminating location? Or a combination thereof? So what this model is telling us is that control is by what is discriminated, what is detected by the organism. And generalization distorts our perception of the present events as they actually occur. And these are the events or our perception of when they occur and when they occur. This is what we use to form the perceived structure of the environment. And it's this structure of the environment that allows us to anticipate what is likely to happen next. So generalization distorts not only our perception of events as they occur, but also our perception of the structure of the environment. And that means that control by the environment as it actually happens is going to be weaker. It's not going to be perfect. So control is by the likely future as extrapolated from past experience. But it's by the likely future as discriminated by the organism. And so really what this is, is to say that control is not a mechanistic push from the past, is what has been strengthened, 
but instead it's a push from the present in that the present provides signposts, discriminative stimuli that tell us what is likely to happen next on the basis of that experience that allows us to discriminate the structure of the environment. And it's a pull from the future as well, because if we can discriminate the structure of the environment, then we can detect what is likely to happen next given the current environmental conditions. It's Friday, I know that tomorrow will most likely be Saturday because of my experience with Fridays always being followed by Saturday. So a push from the present, the present provides signposts that inform us about what's likely to happen next, and also a pull from the future. So understanding where generalization is occurring when we detect events as they occur may be key to understanding why it is that control by the environment is sometimes weak, why behavior is sometimes maladaptive, why there's sometimes no control even in very highly structured environments. And generalization might also determine to some extent the division of control between stimuli, because after all, our environments are complex, there are many different stimuli that are in an environment at any one time. If there are stimulus dimensions that we generalize across to a greater extent, continuously changing dimensions like time, dimensions that we are not well equipped to deal with in terms of our perceptual system, our affordances, like for example with pigeons, pigeons are much better with color than they are with sound. Dimensions of a stimulus across which more generalization occur will mean that that particular stimulus has less control over behavior because it signposts a less certain future. That is, the greater the generalization, the less order we are able to perceive in the world. But of course, there are many possible futures. In any environment, there are multiple signposts, things that tell us about events that might well happen next, and many of those signposts will point to different futures. I can be walking along the street and there might be a cafe, a sign outside that says cheap tacos, and there might be the door to where I'm staying just a few steps down the road, which leads to a nice place to sit and rest. If I haven't eaten for a while and I'm really hungry, then chances are I'm going to follow the signpost that says cheap tacos. But if I've just come back from a fantastic lunch where I've already had a lot of brilliant cheap tacos, then that signpost leading to cheap tacos is not going, that future rather with the cheap tacos is not going to be of any value to me in the present. Instead, the future that leads to a place to, to rest, to have a sleep, is likely to be of more value. So our disposition, our recent interaction with the environment, if you like the state of the organism, but this too is environmentally determined by how we've interacted recently with our environment, whether I've been eating, whether I've been sleeping, whether I've been doing something else, disposition determines which future exerts control. So if you like, it is the compass that orients the organism toward one future over the other, that allows us to choose to follow one signpost instead of following a different signpost. Consider, for example, an experiment where you teach a rat that if the rat turns left, they get food. And if the rat wanders down and it turns right instead, then it gets access to water. So left, food, right, water. And then you put the rat in the maze when the rat is food deprived, the rat will reliably turn left. If you put the rat in the maze when the rat has been deprived of water, then the rat will reliably turn right. So it will take the signpost that leads to a future that is valuable to the rat in the context of its current disposition. And there are some situations in which the future is inescapable. That is, there is only one future that is going to happen, and our experience with the environment allows us to detect what that future is going to be. And in that situation, we move rapidly towards a future that contains valuable events, a future that is desirable in the context of our current disposition, but we move slowly toward a future that is not valuable to us in the context of our current disposition. This was a great experiment done by Jessel and colleagues where they asked children to transition between activities. 
and they ask them to go to either a highly preferred activity or a less preferred activity. The future here is inescapable. There is only one future. You have to go toward the activity that you're directed to. What they did was they measured how quickly those children moved towards that activity. And what they found, and something that we can all relate to, was that when they asked the children to move towards a highly preferred activity, the movement was very rapid. When they asked them to, prefer, to move toward a less preferred activity, the movement was very, very slow. They dawdled. The future was inescapable, but yet behavior in the present was still controlled by what that future was going to be. So what I've taken you through is an account that is essentially a prospective control account, which is a little different from how we usually think about how the environment controls behavior. But this is pr prospective control by events that have occurred. We are taking past events, we're applying generalization processes in order to build a picture of the future as discriminated by the organism. So it's not controlled by events that are yet to happen, it's controlled by the past as that past predicts the future. So really, what I want to leave you with is the idea that the direction of control may be different to how we've considered it. That control is not a mechanistic push from the past, control is a pull from the future, a push from the present because the present points toward the future. In fact, we might even say that to behave is effectively to choose the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Is it, uh, okay. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, so, this question, comment. So, how is it different to say? that an organism detects the structure of the environment from saying that the structure of the environment determines behavior possibly imperfectly? If you add detection in there, then you can use generalization. So you have a mechanism for the difference, for, for the imperfect control. If you say that the environmental structure determines behavior imperfectly, you have no explanation for why that control is imperfect. So this is not, this is not an approach that requires an inner organism. It's not, um, it's not taking the control from the environment. It's just saying that the reason that there is imperfect control by the environment is because the environment, the input from the environment, um, there's, a, I guess, a translation process to the output, the behavior, and that is filtered, if you like, by the generalization processes, that perception is not perfect. So if we go back to just talking about generalization, uh, color, let's say, in a pigeon. And we know that the pigeon will peck at colors that are around the one that was trained. Uh, how, how does that involve detection? Isn't that just imperfect control? Isn't the pigeon detecting the color? No, I mean, the color is determining the behavior. But why is red occasioning more behavior than orange, which is occasioning more behavior than yellow, which is occasioning more behavior well, than green? Granted, it's imperfect. I, I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that it's not. I'm just saying, why insert the organism in there detecting when... Uh, it's enough to say that, uh, and you almost said it uh, actually a little while ago, I mean, they, they, you know, 
it may have something to do with the pigeon's visual system, uh, various things like that. Uh, but the, con the control is imperfect, and uh, we can perhaps understand it in some uh, way physi uh, by the physi physiology of the pigeon, but I don't see the necessity of inserting detection in there. I think if our goal is not only to, well, if our goal is to understand, predict, and explain behavior, we need to be able to get from environment to behavior and not just to say it's imperfect control. We need to know why it's imperfect control. And that necessarily, the organism is the thing that's doing the behaving. It is the, it's the, I guess it's the filter between the environment and the behavior in a sense. And we know that there is almost no circumstance in which you get perfect control by the environment. Even if you have a concurrent VI extinction, you still get some responding on the extinction key. So this generalization, if it is generalization or whatever it is, this imperfect control seems to be something that is pretty ubiquitous. So it's something that needs an explanation rather than just a label. Well, but the, 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 but the problem is that by talking about the detection, you actually do move to you know, the internal pigeon. Uh, you, uh, it's inescapable, actually. Uh, and uh, I mean, take a, uh, let's take a physical system, you know, which uh, you know, involves some variability, uh, you know, uh, let's say uh, pushing on the accelerator of a car, and uh, and you know the accelerator the accelerator doesn't always work the same way. So do we say the engine of the car detects the ac accelerator, or do we say the accelerator pedal controls the engine, and with some degree of variability. So it's not entirely perfect control. I guess it depends. If we were the car manufacturer, we'd probably want to go a little bit further than just saying that there's some degree of variation in that control, right? If we're the end user, then that might be a perfectly fine explanation, but if you really want to get into the mechanics and to be sure that you understand the system and that you know what the output is, that you're not going to sell this car and sometimes somebody's going to put their foot very softly on the accelerator and it's going to go forward at a rate of knots and other times they'll put their foot on it hard and it's just going to crawl along. If we want to be able to say exactly what it's going to do, we need to understand the mechanics of that system beyond just saying that there's some degree of variability. We need to know why, under what circumstances will there be variability. Right, I totally agree with that. But I don't agree with saying the engine detects the accelerator. But I guess I don't agree with saying that the engine detects the accelerator either. I have a um, few comments. If, uh which are also kind of general, but uh, um, I have, um, well, I, I, I like your approach, but I have this kind of, um, uh, comes to, to me that many of the uh, things you are touching really are kind of uh, uh, classic uh, uh, problems. For instance, when you started uh, talking about this issue of um, when uh, the reinforcer changed location, and then, and then you learn to choose, let's say, the alternative option because it changes from trial to trial. Um, that's the same that in the old times people were working in a phenomenon called patterning effect. So, so for instance, the rat went to the right side and then the next trial has to go to the left. And then learning to do the opposite of what was did before because it is reinforcer, reinforce. Uh, that's ca kind of natural thing, and it's more natural than repeat, really. So, my comment really is a comment is uh, to have to, to have anything new on that. What well, I mean, new. I mean, 
different or, or, is the, or is explaining the same thing? I guess it's explaining the same thing. I mean, the, the, the problem is essentially the same, that we're, we're trying to explain this behavior and the explanations that we can choose from, previously we've used sort of reinforcement strengthening explanations, that we strengthen the pattern, the sequence of behaviors okay. rather than, or, or something like this. So this is just same old problem, okay. demonstration, you know, new data, replicating a very old effect, um, but a slightly different approach to understanding why it is, what's controlling that behavior. It's a kind of similar discussion with Bill the other day, but for instance, there's another very classic um, thing that came to me. And I remember uh, Skinner wrote things like, uh, uh, when the pigeon peck a key, it looks like if the pigeon is pecking the key for getting food, but that's wrong. It's pecking the key because in the past, the, 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 the food came after pecking or something like that, because of the history of reinforcement, he said. But that, that's the same again. So, so it looks like you are behaving like for the future, but really what is controlling is the past. Yes, the control, it's, it's, the control it's kind risks. kind of the same thing, is it not? It, in, in a sense it is, but it is, um, the reason the past is controlling behavior is because it allows us to detect the structure of the environment and behave according to what is likely to happen next, rather than the past controlling our behavior because it's built up a strength of the behavior or a strength of a connection or a strength yeah. of a reflex yeah. reserve. Um, so, and, and there will be situations where um, it looks very much like strengthening because we're just repeating the same behavior over and over, but that's because in that environment, repeating that behavior will get you the next reinforcer as well. So I guess the, the, okay. the way that the past is controlling the behavior is different, but the important thing is that it is still the past controlling behavior, that we're not trying to come up with an explanation of behavior that is based on events that have never ever happened, because that would be a bad science. We're using events that have happened, we're just shifting the way that we use the past to explain why behavior occurs. <laughs> really, nobody else? Variety. <laughs> Variety. No, <it's> <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That, that was a joke. Okay, okay. Hi. Now, yes. Uh, so, I guess my question is about the last part of the talk when you mentioned that. At the end, depending on what the animal have in the past, like if I'm hungry, I'm probably going to choose between food and water, the food. So that's, again, it's nothing very new in that sense. But I want to know how the motivation of the state relate with your idea of generalization. How, how, sorry, could you repeat that last part? How the motivation of the state relate with your idea of generalization. Ah, okay, that's, that's an excellent question. And I guess the answer would be that I don't know that I've explored that particular angle of it. Um, I guess that it is the, the generalization is important there because it still determines the degree to which current stimuli in the current environment appear to point to a valuable future. So if there's a lot of generalization um, across one dimension, that's associated with the current stimulus, then that stimulus will appear to be a very unreliable predictor of some currently important event. Um, and another one where there is less generalization might appear to be a more reliable event. But how motivation and generalization interact, I think would be a really fantastic series of experiments to do, um, but not something that I've explored yet. So how, uh, how crucial is the idea of the misallocation of reinforcers between the two keys 
to your model. If you left it, that out, would your model still work okay with the generalization in time? It would work okay, but it would work noticeably worse. That misallocation really adds explanatory power, and it's not just because we have an extra parameter in there, so obviously it's going to do better. Um, it does, the model performs better than a simpler model. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the trouble is, you know, that that misallocation, it, ne it doesn't happen in concurrent schedules. Uh, the, so the, there's a contradiction there. Uh, the, uh, I mean, that, that misallocation idea has been tested pretty thoroughly and it you know, doesn't, doesn't work for uh, uh, concurrent, just regular concurrent schedules. Does it not? It seemed fairly convincing with uh, things like Davison and Jones, 1998, where you've got concurrent VI extinction. Um, I guess the other thing to add is that the misallocation, the parameter is there, but it doesn't have to have a value that is greater than zero. So it's possible that if there is a situation where there is no generalization across some dimension, where everything is perfectly discriminated in space, then there should be that misallocation parameter should be zero. Yeah, and it and it is too. But uh, so suppose suppose we did an experiment like this. Suppose that there was one key that paid off according to a variable interval schedule, and the other key doesn't pay off at all. And that's true for the whole session. Now, uh, if, if that's always true, uh, and from day to day it's true, and, uh, and you switch the key that happens to be hot, uh, and, and, the, and the pigeons, I mean, a, a, a sensible pigeon, once it got food, would never peck the key that, that didn't pr produce the food. It would only peck, uh, you know. But, but if the pigeon pecks uh, quite a bit before it actually uh, completely prefers the hot key, is that due to misallocation? I guess you'd have to ask the model. Um, but I suppose that, I guess, are you, what you're getting at is that there's a, there should be a fixed and sample pattern as well, right? That it's not adaptive to go exclusive on one alternative because if something changes, you'll miss that change? Yeah, maybe it has something to do with inherent, uh, you know, tendencies to distribute behavior or inherent variability that has nothing to do with misallocation. That's fair, but that's, that's an empirical question, right? You've got to I come up with I hope it is, the, yeah. I, I think it should be. Sorry, we have to complete, to finish here, <laughs> because this time is almost six. Oh, thank you, Sarah, for your nice presentation and for all your, for attending here. Thank you so much.